Good morning. I'm Randy Horton, VP of Solutions and Partnerships at Orthogonal. And I'm Bernhard Kappa, the founder and CEO of Orthogonal. Orthogonal is a product development consulting firm. We work with medical device manufacturers to help them accelerate their development of connected medical devices, software as a medical device, and digital therapeutics. We'll be presenting today on the topic of patient engagement in connected medical devices. We want to thank all of you for joining us here today. We appreciate you taking time out of your busy days and look forward to interacting with you in the Q&A. Um, I'd also like to add that Bernhard and I are both fully vaccinated, so we are being quite responsible while enjoying the fact that we're able to co-present together for the first time in over a year. So thanks for all of you for watching and thanks you also to the Celligence team for inviting us. All right, Bernhard, let's get rolling. When people think of state-of-the-art healthcare in this country, often what comes to mind are big gleaming buildings with big pieces of machinery inside, big iron. MRIs, radiation therapy machines, that do very powerful things. But they're highly controlled environments and they depend on operating in highly controlled environments. Patients are essentially summoned to these devices and do exactly what a tech tells them at the order of a doctor in order to get the benefits of the devices. And while these are really remarkable things, in many ways, they make up a fairly limited part of what impacts healthcare cost and outcome in this country today. As you know, the exploding costs of care and the growing demands for care are largely related to things that happen in our bodies day to day, things that we have some control over or influence over in our normal lives, outside of the hospital, outside of the doctor's office. We're talking about chronic disease conditions like COPD, diabetes, and hypertension. And the more we can deal with these things through early diagnosis, ongoing monitoring, and smaller, more effective doses of treatment, the more we can prevent illness and delay disease, or even defeat it. And the shift of healthcare out of hospitals and into the home that was accelerated by COVID-19 has really accelerated this because a lot more people are asking, why does a patient need to come in to see a doctor or a nurse hands-on at any given time? Is it really that important that they come in? But engaging people in their day-to-day -day lives when your doctor and care team aren't physically present is a very different healthcare challenge than treating people in outpatient or inpatient settings. The home, the car, the office, the supermarket. A medical professional isn't standing there telling you, it's time to get up, it's time to go to sleep. You should really eat this and not that. Have you taken your medicines? You're on your own for those things. And while you may know what the right thing to do is, that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to do it. After all, we're only human. So patient engagement is an idea that's been around for a while. It's about getting people involved in their own care and giving them the tools and the nudges to move towards better behaviors and away from worse ones by helping them help themselves. There's a famous line from the baseball movie, Field of Dreams. If you build it, they will come. So if you were gonna to translate to that to medical devices, you might say, if you prescribe it, they will use it. But the truth is that the Field of Dreams principle really does not apply with medical devices and patient engagement at the home. If you prescribe it, they may not engage. Or if they do engage, it may not be in the exact way you intended. So most likely, you should just assume they won't engage. Just look at online classrooms for kids who are at home because of COVID learning. If you put a child in a Zoom classroom, that doesn't mean they're engaged. It doesn't mean they're learning. Those are two very different things between logging in and actually being a part of the classroom. And many people have seen that lately. In the same way, if you're gonna just drop a medical device into somebody's lap at home, you can't magically expect that they're gonna use it the way it's intended and get every last ounce of value out of it. So as a result, we don't have to just bring devices, to people to devices, we have to bring the devices to people. We have to let the devices fit into the patient's lifestyle and not vice versa. Uh, so maybe what you could say instead would be, if you design it to blend into people's lifestyles, they will engage with it to their benefit. And this is part of something we've been talking about in, in some writing we've been doing with uh, our colleague Adrian Pittman, who recently moved from Google to LinkedIn, that medical manufacture, device manufacturers in some ways are gonna be shifting from being manufacturers of medical devices to manufacturers of medical grade lifestyle devices. And that's a very different thing. There's a lot of examples of lifestyle devices not in healthcare. Things that you use every day or frequently. Things that you really count on, you want them to work, but you also don't want to think about them. You just want them to work. Paper clips, post-it notes, your coffee pot, your internet router, 
All of these, when they're not there or they're not functioning, it's annoying. But other than that, you really don't want to think about them. You just want them to blend into the background. Bernard. Dear mom and dad, you can have my smartphone when you pry it from my cold, dead fingers. Sincerely, your teenager. I'm the father of two teenage daughters, and while those aren't their exact words, that is exactly how they feel. This is a device that really is a home run in fitting into our lifestyle and just working the way we need it to do. It's addictive. Why is that? Why is it so woven into our lives? Well, it's simple. It's the world at your fingertips, in your pocket, instantaneously. Your friends, your work, your information, devices, your house, your car, things you haven't even thought of yet. It's become an all-purpose tool that is both an extension of ourselves and our connections to the world as phones, texting, messaging tools, access to the world's visual library. How did this get here? It's not really something that just magically appeared. It's actually part of a larger trend, which is this concept of software eating the world. It's something that Mark Andreessen coined in 2011. Uh, he was the founder of Netscape and a partner in the VC firm Andreessen Horowitz. He wrote a famous article about this in the Wall Street Journal, and his observation was that software is eating the world in all sectors, and in the future, every company will become a software company. This was pretty controversial at the time, but it no longer is. Really, this is what's been happening, and the smartphones are an extension of that. What's been happening is all of these things have been getting faster, better, smarter. If you look at a smartphone from uh, uh, the first iPhone to smartphones now, they are significantly faster, significantly better, and more connected. It's not just mobile, it's all hardware and software that is getting faster and better. There are more connected devices, there are more things you can access and control, IoT, cloud computing, all the network effects that come out of that. And all of that means that there's also more data, more data that you can work with, more data that you can consume, but also more data about you, about what you're doing, about how you're behaving, about what you like, and how you respond to stimuli, and how products are performing in doing those things for you. That's where AI comes in as well. AI can take all of that data and generate algorithms, generate things for you to react to and to consume and to pay attention to. You put all of those things together and software is eating the world even faster. There's a really good illustration of this in a recent Wall Street Journal review of the Apple AirPods Pro. It's not the first review, it's the second review a year after the initial review. It's not a review of new AirPods Pro, it's a new review of the same AirPods Pro. And it's a much better review than the first review was. Why is that? Well, better software. Apple kept collecting data and feedback and continued to improve the software to the point where the journal did a whole new review of the product and gave it rave reviews. All of that is collecting data and AI and using software to improve the product. Randy? So usually when we talk about a competitor in our industry, what we're talking about is another device company that's made another device performing the same clinical function. And life is good when your device is cheaper and more effective than their device. But when you're trying to engage with patients in their daily lives, we have a whole new class of competition, and most of that competition really has nothing to do with you or your medical device or even the patient's health. Patients aren't un understimulated. They're not bored. They're not waiting at home for someone to drop an app on their phone that's going to engage them. Really, we're in a full all-out battle for the attention of our patients. And right now, the battle is being fought between the new tweet from Krispy Kreme about the latest item on their menu and your glucometer's flashing red warning sign. A few years ago, I came across this article about the last remaining patients in America still using an iron lung. 
The Iron Lung is really an incredible device. I mean, just look at the picture here. It's a workhorse of science and engineering that's lasted decades. And it's something that the medical device sector, I think it's illustrative of something that we're really good at. We build safe and effective devices that are engineered and built to work as promised. But I'm guessing that nobody would say that the Iron Lung is very good at patient engagement. The science fiction writer William Gibson famously said, the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed. And the kind of picture we're painting today doesn't exist in a single success story. But all the elements of what patient engagement with connected medical devices look like can already be found in different places. So with an act of fusion imagination, we can envision what it might look like when we are successful at this. We're going to be borrowing elements from consumer electronics, the Internet of Things, learning from Facebook and Google and Amazon and Spotify, the people who make Pokemon, that franchise, they clearly know how to engage people in different medium over long periods of time. And yes, there are some early success stories that we'd like to point out from the medical device space. One great example of embedding a therapeutic device in people's lives is Achille. If you haven't heard of them, they have the first FDA approved prescription video game. I'll say that again, it's a prescription video game. And the reason you need a prescription for it is it's actually a covert treatment for children who have ADHD. So I'm asking you what's easier in terms of patient engagement. Dragging your kid on a sunny day to some therapy session in an office, or giving them permission when they ask you to play a video game This just happens to be a therapeutic. Achille has done the equivalent of hiding vegetables in food so that kids don't even know they're eating the vegetables, they just know they love the food. Two great examples of bringing medical devices into people's lives where they live. Not in the home, but into places that they frequent. On the left, it's a device that's been brought into a barber shop. And on the right, you'll see many of these devices in pharmacies and community centers around America. The one on the left is from Cedar sinai They were trying to tackle the problem of hypertension among African-American men. And they decided that their efforts were better spent rather than trying to get African-American men to come to the clinic to be diagnosed and treated for hypertension, that they would go to where they could find the patients they needed to reach. So they teamed up with barber shops across LA and embedded in them these devices, which are a combination of a blood, a blood pressure cuff and a, a, a telemedicine station. And they brought pharmacists in physically to recruit patients to participate in this, in this study. And then when people return for later haircuts, the barber is trained to essentially nudge the patient before you get a haircut, would you mind sitting down, doing another blood pressure check, and if you need, talking to somebody remotely. So this is bringing a device to people where they are in their lives to get them to use it. Higgy's done a very similar thing. This is a machine that you can step up to and it takes a bunch of basic vitals and will beam them, it'll show you what your vitals are and it'll send them back to your doctor. But it allows a really, a robust set of vitals to be taken in a professional, consistent way without having people come into the doctor's office. You slide into the machine, you sit down, and you do it for a couple of minutes on your way to picking up a drug or your, your gallon of milk. The last example we want to talk about is from Quidel, one of our clients. They make point of care diagnostics for infectious diseases, including COVID-19. On the left is the Sophia 2 device. That's a cornerstone of their product suite. You insert an assay cartridge into it for a specific infectious disease, and it spits out a test result. It's hardware sort of similar to a video game console. Quidel manufactures the console, and then they make lots and lots of game cartridges that they sell, each of which is, can be for different tests. And the Sophia 2 machine can interpret for lots of different infectious disease tests. It's not big iron, you can see it from this. You call it maybe medium iron. But it's certainly a substantial piece of lab equipment, and it's not something that you're gonna easily manufacture by the millions. The device on the right is the Sophia Q. It's Quidel's newest member of their Sophia product lineup. It's very similar to the Sophia 2. It can read the same immunoassay cartridges. But in this case, the images from the cartridges are captured and interpreted by an AI algorithm using a combination of this very small device, a smartphone, and a cloud infrastructure. So there's a number of benefits to the Q system that make it distinct from the Sophia 2. First, affordability. It's a much smaller piece of hardware, which is much easier to manufacture. Second, that means you can scale up rapid manufacturing and actually can produce millions of these devices. Third, because it's based, based the interpretation is based on an AI algorithm, it can get smarter and better over time, just like the AirPods with their one year review. And finally, mobility. When you combine smartphones, internet connectivity, and small devices together, 
you can start to embed infectious disease diagnostic tools in all kinds of settings that really weren't feasible before, like nursing homes and clinics and uh, pharmacies. And what that means is that even though patients aren't directly engaging with the SOFIA Q, you're bringing the healthcare system to where they are and bringing the functions, important functions of the healthcare system to where people are in their lives and enabling them to get the care faster, better, earlier. I would add to this that you can actually get direct patient uh, engagement with these types of devices. Uh, Sophia Q is going to be integrated into telemedicine and probably uh, be available as a home test in the future as well, at which point direct patient engagement is going to be a big part of it. So if we look at product development outside of the medical space, right, it's some remarkable stuff that's going on there. What do people actually do outside of the medical device space? And can we take some of that and bring that into the medical device space? So outside of the medical device space, it is a very fast iterative world. As we saw before, things are changing quickly. It's an ecosystem of interlocking parts that all magnify each other and amplify each other. And in that world, the fastest learner wins. There are a whole bunch of techniques from lean startup to design thinking that are there that can be used to iteratively improve a product. It starts by thinking about the hypotheses and really validating your hypotheses as you go along and build out a business model and build out uh, your company and its products. You've got to ask questions like, will this idea work? Will someone use it? Will someone pay for it? Will they buy it from me? Who is going to use it? And how will they value it? All of these things are things that you can iteratively get feedback on and iteratively go out and test. The thing that a lot of these companies do is actually go out there and talk to users and get data about users and then go validate their assumptions with these users. When you're building products like this, your software products are never really done. There is a continuous fast feedback loop for getting data, using that data to make improvements, measuring that, and then continuing the cycle to continuously improve. So you're always out there getting qualitative data about your users what their needs are, you come up with solutions, you get feedback on that, and then you apply all these wonderful agile development, DevOps techniques in order to rapidly release new software out there. When you launch, you now get feedback from that and you can continue to improve. You can even do things like A-B testing or multivariate testing to test the effects of new features uh, and then use that learning to go back into your qualitative, why are people doing this? And that can be done faster and faster and faster. That's how it works. But I hear you cry, Randy. All right, Bernhard. So we can debate whether I'm the Greek chorus or the Debbie Downer in the room. But I'm gonna ask a question that may be in the minds of a lot of the people watching this today. Um, it's great if we can move faster, better, cheaper, and smarter with, with digital methods. But an insulin pump is in Snapchat, and a surgically implanted uh, spine stimulator from the nerve is not Netflix. These are regulated medical devices, and there's good reason they're regulated. Nobody wants to be the next Theranos or thalidomide. So how do you mesh these worlds? Because the Silicon Valley got famous for saying, we'll move fast and break things. But in our world, if we move fast and break things, what we're breaking is the human body. And if it's a connected device, there's a real risk we're gonna be doing it at scale. So how do you reconcile move fast and break things with first do no harm? You make a good point, Randy. But just because you have additional constraints does not mean that you can't incorporate these fast feedback loop approaches. You just have to take those constraints into consideration. Let me give you an example of that. One of the best practices for product development is this concept of three user Thursdays. That means every Thursday you have three users, 
you're in there and you're getting feedback from, you're testing with, et cetera. Basically, it's a weekly cycle of user interactions, testing, and feedback. You can still do this kind of work, and in fact, it's an improvement over how we get feedback now. You just have to take a couple of things into consideration as you're doing this user, these user feedback sessions and this user testing. You need to take human factors into consideration as part of that. So you need to pay attention to potential use errors and how you would mitigate these. You can get through and refine your mitigations for those use errors much better and much faster by using this technique than you would have by having human factor sessions every two, three, four months. You can just get many more cycles and much better refinement. So it's a technique that works and it just needs to take those constraints into consideration. Similarly, using product analytics, which is de rigueur, in the rest of the world isn't really done much in the medical device space. But product analytics can tell you exactly how your users are behaving and you can feed that into your qualitative research as to why they're doing things. And you can also use this as part of your, your process for refining your product. The problem, is, of course, is that you have a constraint of HIPAA compliance needing to protect your patient's data but the reality is there are product analytics products like Mixpanel that you can make HIPAA compliant and where you can strip out patient identifiable information and you can use this to continue to improve your product. In a similar way, all those software engineering best practices, agile de development, test-driven development, behavior-driven design, testing automation, cloud DevOps, self-healing infrastructure, just basic modularity are great software practices that actually help you make products better, make them more robust, and make them more reliable. These are things that are good practices that are actually things that the FDA has blessed as standards that should be part of what you're doing. They happen to allow you to do things faster than if you were doing things in an old waterfall way, but that doesn't make them less reliable. The problem that you do run into here because of patient safety and because of the regulatory compliance issues is around launching new features, right? So, you do need to do extra work here. You need to take constraints uh, into consideration. In particular, you need to do risk analysis, determine the impact uh, on effectiveness, on claims, uh, on intended use, and on indications for use. But when you do that, then you can also leverage things like software seg segregation as per IEC 62304 for higher risk areas so that you can then more freely iterate on low risk areas. You can also potentially use the SAMD predetermined change control plan that the FDA introduced in their recent position paper on AI in medical devices. You can leverage real world data for additional claims. And even if you can't do A-B testing the way you might in another product, you can do canary testing, which is a form of A-B testing where you have a new version that gets released to a small subset while the rest of the people are using the old version and you can measure the difference between those. That's in fact something that was mentioned as a best practice in the FDA's pre-cert working model best practices. You do have to do periodic filing when there's lots of changes, but there are lots of opportunities for you to iterate and, and rapidly release new software in those areas. But I hear you cry. Hey, Bernhard, what about clinical trials? All right, that is actually an excellent point. The fact is that only about 10% of the FDA 510K clearances involve clinical trials. So the vast majority of medical device filings don't involve clinical trials. But for the ones that do involve clinical trials, 
It's true. That is definitely a big barrier to iterating and to moving fast. It's an inefficient process. It's expensive. I think it's needlessly expensive and needlessly inefficient, but it's a thorny problem. And it's definitely not designed for software that can change quickly and for getting the kind of fast feedback that we have. The one thing I would say there is that there has been a shift and there has been rethinking around clinical trials, especially during this time of, uh, of COVID, during the pa pandemic, people have been rethinking clinical trials and actually focusing on how we can be more efficient. And some things that were just not done started to be doing, uh, done more. Having more central clinical trials, actually having focus on the metrics of, of efficiency and efficiency of IRBs is part of what started happening. There have been things like adaptive clinical trials that have become more and more prevalent, and certainly the FDA in 2016 already uh, provided guidance around FDA clinical trials, but obviously there are limits within that uh, as well. There are also some companies that are exploring the concept of a permanent beta and having a continuous IRB uh, process for, for those types of things. All of this is still, I would say, a big barrier, but there is movement there, and it's certainly, I think, one of the big areas that we should be focusing on uh, for improving our products and improving how we get life-saving technologies into, uh, into the hands of patients. Um, I would also say that if you're going to be doing a lot of clinical trials, you should really work on optimizing those things. There's a big advantage in, in better IRBs, focusing on the metrics, both safety uh, and efficacy metrics, but also efficiency metrics, uh, and leveraging things like adaptive trials and real-world evidence. So when we talk about patient engagement in connected medical devices, it's important to point out that all of this isn't happening in a vacuum. And now, I'm not gonna go into these points in a lot of detail, but there are some larger trends going on that you'll need to keep in mind as you try and crack this nut. One, obviously, is COVID-19 and its acceleration of te telemedicine and remote patient monitoring. Another one is the slow but ongoing evolution towards population health management and value-based reimbursement. You can't overlook the explosion of energy going on around the creation of software as a medical device and digital therapeutics. And lastly, a trend from the tech sector that's getting a lot of attention in healthcare, and I think you see a lot of people trying to emulate it, is the whole idea that large monolithic companies and mon monolithic product suites are being replaced by ecosystems and platforms. So earlier this month, there was an article in Stat Plus that talked about a big trend with virtual healthcare firms like telemedicine providers and chronic disease management companies. And it talked about how they're moving away from sort of the traditional model, traditional now, of a doctor Zooming with a patient to a team-based care of delivery approach. So they're talking about teams of specialists, coaches, and therapists who establish a relationship with each patient and guide them over time. In other words, they're trying to deliver care delivery models where the patient is actively engaged in the manner that best produces the right outcomes. And this is really an acknowledgement that patient engagement is a team sport. It's a very sensible model, and we think there's a lot to it. The article does give a small shout out to medical devices, and it acknowledges the role of things like blood pressure cuffs and glucose monitors to provide the clinicians with ongoing patient vitals. But Bernhard and I think this is really a pretty enormous understatement of the potential of medical devices to impact patient care and to be a part of a care team for patients. And instead, we're gonna propose a sort of manifesto here that we would say in the future, the connected medical device will be far more than just a tool for clinicians to diagnose, monitor, and treat. Instead, the medical device is gonna be an essential member of the care team. And take the example of a patient who has a respiratory issue, chronic issue, and they spend several hours a day doing airway clearance. They're spending far more time with a nebulizer in their mouth than they are with any clinician. That may in fact be their most intimate clinical relationship. And we need to recognize that and take advantage of it. So the way we're gonna do that is with design thinking. 
which is really taking a holistic look at the lives of patients, not just when they use a device, but in their entire lives, including their health issues and their care process, and think about which members of the team should engage when. When should you talk to a doctor? When should you talk to a nurse? When should you get an automated message? When should you interact with a device? And what is the unique role for each of these? And because medical devices keep getting essentially smaller, cheaper, more powerful, more connected, the range of options we have of what a device can do in a care team keep expanding. To get to the point where a medical device, a connected device, is an essential part of a care team, we're gonna to have to look at the best roles for medical devices in a team. That's gonna take a lot of good design thinking. We're gonna to have to consider the total patient experience end to end, not just the moments when they actually use a device. We're gonna to need to remember that in a team, usually team members are not identical and interchangeable. Different people have different strengths and weaknesses, and great teams figure out how to leverage those strengths in a synergistic way. For connected medical devices, they have certain advantages. First of all, they basically never need to sleep. They can do continuous diagnosis, monitoring, and even therapeutics around the clock at different, at different schedules. The sensors in these devices keep getting smaller and more powerful, so the range of things we're able to do is, keeps getting better and better. And finally, they're very quantitative, and they can take that quantitative data and communicate it. They can communicate it to patients, they can communicate it to providers, and they can communicate it to algorithms, all of which give them a very unique vantage point as a member of the care team. One place where there's a lot of great design thinking going about the role of algorithms and devices and smart devices on teams of humans is in the US military. At the US Army Research Lab, their belief is that the future of warfare will involve teams of people and intelligent agents or smart algorithms and smart devices working in concert with people. And they're trying to ha think about what happens when your newest teammate is a chatbot. You know, if, if, if you're in a battlefield and you've got a small earpiece so you can talk to a chatbot and it starts acting like Siri in a bad moment where it doesn't understand you or gives you the wrong directions, what's the first thing you're going to do? You're going to take that earpiece out and you're going to throw it away because you don't have time to worry about something else. And there goes hundreds of, million dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars of research and a huge advantage on the battlefield. In the same way, we're going to need to think about how do we embed devices intelligently so that they interact well as part of the team. Devices are not people, but they may be the most undervalued member of your care team. And getting to a place where we can maximize the value of devices as part of that care team to help with patient engagement, to drive better outcomes, is gonna take a lot of hard work, some good thinking, a very healthy respect for the regulatory process and the things it's designed to promote, but it is possible, it is doable. So wrapping up, one of my all-time favorite movies is a documentary called Young at Heart. It's about a senior citizen's choir in New England. And what's unique about this choir is that they sing rock, punk, and soul music. It's really a blast if you haven't seen it. What the movie is really about is looking at what gives people their lease on life, what motivates them. And what it shows is that if you're elderly and your body is just naturally accruing with time different ailments, you need to find ways to motivate yourself and things that are more important to take your mind off the ailments. And in this movie, for the choir members, it's the music, it's their friendships with each other, you know, it's the satisfaction of doing a great performance. There's a really powerful scene in the movie where one of the choir members is seeing the doctor at, you know, in a hospital and receiving some pretty bad news. And as the doctor's delivering this, the only thing the patient really wants to talk about is will I be able to perform next Friday? When can I get back to the choir? Because that's what gets them up and going in the morning. That's what we need to tap into with medical devices. That's what we need to tap into with medical devices as part of integrated care teams. Find out what motivates people, figure out what they respond to, fit into their lives, and move the needle. And if we can do that, that's a pretty powerful reason to get up every morning and fight the good fight, because everybody we love in our lives is also a patient at some point and will benefit from it. Thank you. Dear mom and dad, you can have my smartphone when you pry it from my cold, dead fingers. Sincerely, your teenager. So I'm the father of two teenage daughters, and my girls definitely feel that way. Why is the smartphone so addictive? Randy, 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 we're having oh, oh, a talk sorry, here. Sorry. Case in point. 
And the last one, which is a major trend from the tech industry, which we're seeing a lot of people paying attention to and trying to emulate in the healthcare industry, is the replacement of monolithic products with ecosystems and... Can I help you? Sorry, just getting a little punchy. Thank you for that. <laughs> the outtakes had me had me cracking up a little bit. Um, okay, first question here. In your opinion, could some doctors and nurses see this kind of trend as a threat if one day you know humans are going to be switched out for connected devices or robots in this space? I think it's possible. It it really depends on how this stuff is uh, is presented and how it works, right? Uh, a lot of the stresses I think that uh, doctors and nurses have uh, are a result of kind of the current business models. I'm married to uh, an anesthesiologist and uh, all of her siblings are in various uh, uh, specialties. And, you know, it's it's the, the pressure to move quickly and to spend less time with patients uh, is is really big. Um, and so depending on how you integrate these types of things into what they're doing, you've got to ask, does it make their lives easier or do they perceive it as something that improves patient care uh, while not increasing their risk of getting sued or, uh, uh, or having to do extra documentation, all these things that... Uh, that are big uh, concerns for them right now. Um, uh, I think there are a couple of areas like uh, radiology where, you know, we've seen that, uh, that where it's, you know, it's much more directly something that is uh, part of what they do. Uh, but I think in that case, the, um, uh, again, it's how you, how you present this. Um, it's how you provide uh, uh, kind of the education that, and the, uh, the feedback that this is something not designed to replace you because it's going to be a long time before, uh, before uh, physicians are, uh, are replaced, but it's something that's going to make you better and more powerful and more effective. Okay, got it. No, that makes sense. Thank you for that. Um, now, next question here. Um, who is using these techniques in the medical device space? So I think it's uh, it, the the quote from uh, William Gibson that the future is already here but unevenly distributed is is definitely something that makes sense in this industry around digital health. I'd say that you know the areas that have had the greatest sort of pressure around this have been in in areas uh, around chronic diseases, in particular in diabetes. Um, we've been doing digital health there for, uh, for a long time and we've been integrating kind of the ecosystem and people have been competing and trying to move faster and faster. So uh, a lot of our clients in the diabetes space are very much uh, using these techniques. They're doing things like uh, three user Thursdays. Uh, they are uh, absolutely uh, thinking about and doing things like software segregation uh, and figuring out how can they apply DevOps and move faster. I'd say uh, cardiac monitoring is another area where some of that is, uh, uh, is happening. And uh, I think there are a few other, the, the more connected and the more, uh, uh, the more there are kind of real world um, uh, pressures, um, you know, bundling and those types of things, uh, the more uh, this is happening. But there's some areas where it's, it's, it's pretty far behind others. Um, and it's likely a combination of, are they, you know, how much is software part of their DNA? Uh, and what are the, you know, the pressures for real world performance and demonstrating it? Okay, okay, got it. No, thank you for that. Very comprehensive. Um, the next question we have here is a little bit more general, but um, it's still interesting nonetheless. Um, what are the next big trends in digital health and connected devices from your perspective? 
Yeah. So, I mean, I think there, there are obviously things that are ongoing where the regulations are sort of catching up and the standards are catching up, right? So, uh, how do we use or apply uh, cloud computing effectively? How do we do that safely? I know we're working on uh, on um, consensus report right now uh, at Amy around that and getting FDA feedback on it. Um, all of the integration of devices outside of the hospital is definitely a trend with COVID that uh, that has been accelerated. So telemedicine has gotten a big push and is probably not going away. Uh, it's not going to draw back. It's not going to be all encompassing. Uh, so integration of all of these devices, how do you integrate, uh, you know, um, COVID testing, let's say, or strep testing into telemedicine? Um, how do you integrate uh, cardiac monitoring perhaps with diabetes or with, uh, with various other things where there are comorbidities um, and bring all of these things together? Those are, you know, those are big trends. And then I think uh, the, another one I think that is really starting to happen is somewhere about Two years ago, um, pharma woke up to the fact that they can't just do general health and wellness applications. They actually need to uh, have digital health offerings that, uh, that deal with very specific disease states. So they are building out software as a medical device, um, you know, new divisions. They are actively building products in the space and putting a lot of money in the space. Uh, and you should be seeing a lot more um, uh, regulatory filings, uh, 510Ks coming uh, from pharmaceutical firms as well. So they're, they're absolutely entering the game. And I think it's going to change a bunch of things in the space as well. Okay, got it. Thank you for that. Um, next question we have here um, is actually from an industry member. Um, so a lot of the things that you are speaking about sound great, but I work for a very large medical device firm, and there are a lot of highly established processes that I have to work with them. So how do I try to bring about change to happen when I'm just a single player in a very large organization? That is a... Uh, that, it, question that I've, uh, I've run across before. I think ultimately you have to find things within that organization where there are both pain points and people, th the pain has to be big enough. Um, and uh, it has, there have to be uh, enough sort of like-minded people or people uh, in positions of power uh, who are willing to champion and affect change. So you're not going to change the entire organization all at once, uh, but you have to look for opportunities within the organization. A lot of the companies we work with um, either see the opportunity uh, to, uh, to uh, you know, out-compete uh, folks uh, in this space by applying fast feedback loops and by applying modern techniques, or they realize they're falling behind in some area and they need to make changes because they're just not getting products out fast enough. And why are our competitors delivering these things into the market? And we're falling behind. Um, so, you know, if you're in a company where that's five years or 10 years away. Like, you know, uh, I think a lot of uh, the orthopedics companies are maybe look for another company. <laughs> that's one, one way to do it. Or again, you know, uh, uh, are there change agents? Are there people you can talk to that you can look for particular areas where even if you make a small change uh, uh, that can kind of move the need a little bit, um, that's, you know, that is one way of starting momentum. But it's a hard problem, right? That's why a lot of large companies don't end up, um, uh, you know, being able to last and uh, compete well uh, over the long haul because they, you know, they run into the classic innovators dilemma. Okay, thank you for that. No, that's a very interesting point. Um, some interesting points you brought up there. Um, looks like we have time for a few more questions. Um, I have a couple here. 
this one related to smartphones. Um, so if we engage patients through their smartphones, obviously we don't control what type of smartphone they use, whether it's Android, iPhone, or a different model or version of an Android, Android or iPhone. How do I handle all of that to ensure a consistently safe and properly functioning experience for the patient within the app? Yeah, so I think, you know, this, the, uh, obviously you can't test absolutely every single Android smartphone all over the world with all of the OS variants and what specific, um, uh, you know, um, vendors have put in, et cetera. Um, so, you know, the classic uh, FDA response is to use a risk-based approach to this. And that's what I would say in this case as well. So, you know, for, for a lot of lower risk things, if the potential harm uh, is, is really, you know, very minor uh, on certain areas, then you can probably uh, test some subset uh, uh, of phones and operating systems uh, as your kind of baseline. Um, and then obviously do monitoring in the field. Um, and, you know, you've got probably a, 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 a you know, use the, use the phone on, uh, uh, use the app on the phone you're allowed to, uh, and one that is a, you know, nope, it won't work on, 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 on the phone. We won't allow you to use this particular smartphone OS uh, uh, variant. And then if you do run into problems, be able to fix those, uh, those issues quickly. And then, you know, uh, add, uh, add that phone to the phones that, uh, or that, uh, OS, uh, to the ones you're testing, obviously do lots of testing automation, uh, around this. And then as you kind of move up the risk curve, uh, you can add more, uh, testing automation, different environments that you test in uh, for this. There's a whole bunch of techniques you can use um, uh, from kind of field level self-validation if you're doing things like Bluetooth uh, uh, testing, combining that with uh, whitelist, blacklist, graylist, um, uh, potentially using device farms and testing automation on those uh, device farms uh, as well uh, that you can try to apply as you kind of move up to things that are higher and higher risk uh, in terms of that. And then the last is basically only allow certain phone models uh, to be used in the first place, right? Uh, so where you have to test all of those, but, but that would be some, you know, fairly high risk uh, uh, connected device systems. Okay, yeah, no, that makes sense. That's definitely something to keep in mind moving forward here. Um, the next question here is actually uh, related. Um, do you think that big tech firms like the Google, Microsoft, or Apple could one day figure this out and become the Google of medical devices per se, and possibly displace the current major medical device firms at the moment? I So we work with some of those firms. And so I, I would say, you know, it's, I think it's very difficult uh, to, marry these two different approaches, right? And the different bodies of knowledge. So uh, just as I think medical device firms have challenges around doing modern software development methods and, and approaches, uh, I think these other companies have, you know, difficulties dealing with quality management and with, you know, clinical efficacy and all of those types of things. That's really not so much in their DNA. I think they are starting to work on that. They are catching up on that. And, and you know, I know they've been, we've been working with, with some of those folks and I think it'll, it'll take a while for them to catch up, but I don't think uh, that they're going to be doing everything in the space, right? There's, there are so many disease states. There are so many uh, um, things where really specialized knowledge is needed. Um, that I think there are going to be players, some of them may be, you know, ones that grow up outside of traditional medical device companies or these other companies. And then it's a question of where, you know, where do they fit in best? Who is going to, um, who's going to acquire them uh, ultimately? And, uh, and will they continue to create value once they're acquired? 
Right. Okay. No, that makes sense to me. Definitely. Yeah. But the jury is still out as to who ultimately is going to win in this space. There's a lot of, you know, white space in between uh, all of these uh, these players and people. You know, pharma's trying to figure it out. Device companies are trying to figure it out. Digital natives are trying to figure it out. Um, and the big tech companies are trying to figure it out as well. Right. Okay. No, that makes sense. Um, looks like we'll have time for probably one more here. Um, so if there's any final points you want to make possibly on the biggest lessons, um, any problems or constraints in terms of feedback loops? Yeah, or, I saw one in here as well. Uh, on uh, So uh, l let me answer that. And then there's another one here. Um, as at the pace, the SAMD connected devices now, the medical degree lifestyles are moving, do you think the regulatory agencies are lagging? So uh, I'll take those two. And um, so the first one, I think, if you think about it, all of this fast feedback loop stuff, right? It's a technique you can apply to everything uh, as a way of getting information uh, from, you know, uh, more information and acting on it quickly, right? Whether this is uh, you're, you're, you're doing OODA loops for, for fighter jets, or you are, uh, doing Six Sigma, uh, all of these things are build, measure, learn loops. So if you think about this, it's just a technique that you can apply to all the constraints, uh, that you have. It's inevitable that it's all going to get you're going to have more data. The regulators are going to have more data. The insurers are going to have more data. Everyone is going to have more data about what's actually going on. So not just during your development process, but for things like post-market surveillance, uh, for, for demonstrating the actual real world effectiveness, you can't hide from that long term, right? You can't say, we don't want to know this stuff. You know, there's liability there, et cetera, et cetera. P people have been able to hide from that, but they can't really do that anymore. And so you have to think about this thing holistically in terms of, you know, post market uh, and, uh, you know, the full life cycle of the product. Um, the, um, I think the regulators are trying to catch up and they're always going to be uh, behind on the space, but they're actually four regulators moving remarkably quickly because there, there is more and more digital health um, software as a medical device, connected device. Uh, there are more products that are out there that they are having to deal with. Um, and they're, uh, they've hired, uh, FDA has created the new Digital Health Center of Excellence. Uh, they are actively uh, producing new um, uh, new guidance uh, uh, around this. And, uh, and frankly, a lot of the industry uh, is moving in terms of standards and guidance and things like that. A lot of things that we're involved with, with, uh, with Amy, uh, for example, uh, are, are, there's, there's a ton of movement. So, it's never, it's always going to be a bit behind. Um, and, you know, if you're at the cutting edge, you're always going to be pioneering some of those things. But I think it's, um, you know, it's not the way it was, say, 10, 20 years ago. They're moving pretty quickly. Okay, got it. No, thank you so much. And thank you again to both you and Randy. I think we're just about out of time here for this presentation. So I just wanted to thank you again. And if there's any final points that uh, you want to get across to the audience, uh, now's your chance. It's ex an exciting area. I'm, you know, it. I, we've been doing this for about 10 years now, and uh, it just keeps, you know, getting faster and uh, faster. And, you know, the consumer world and the medical device world are, you know, are, are much more rapidly coming together and uh, opportunities for creating value are, are huge in the space. So, um, you know, software is eating the world and it's eating right. the medical device space as well. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, no, a lot of interesting points out of your presentation today. Thank you again for all your effort and time. Um, I would like to let everyone know we're, we'll start our next presentation in probably 90 seconds or so, and that'll be from Celligence's own April Complin. So I want to thank our friends over at Orthogonal again for their time today. And thank you, Bernard. All right. Thank you. Thanks to Celligence. And thank, uh, thanks, everyone, for uh, participating.